Hi, my name is Sandy Simpson of Apologetics Coordination Team. And the subject I'd like to deal with today is what I'm terming the new panentheistic God of Christendom. Now, I bet you probably see that title and think that I misspelled the word pantheism. But just so uh, that those of you who write to me advising me of words I've misspelled in articles, and I do often, I want to tell you that I'm using the term panentheism as coined by Carl C.F. Krauss. And you can read more about this word and concept in an excellent book called A Time of Departing by Ray Youngen. You know, there's a new God, quote-unquote, being promoted in the third wave, new apostolic reformation and word of faith movements whose teachers are regularly seen on TBN, Daystar, uh, Sky Angel, CBN, and other Christian TV networks. Some of those teachers even have what would be considered a fairly typical statement of faith or a doctrinal statement they endorse. But by what they teach, they end up promoting a false, unbiblical view of God, especially through their actions and practices and experiences. The whole phenomenon of slain in the spirit, quote-unquote, and all the antics that go with it are brainwashing an entire generation of Christians to put their faith in another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. This new Jesus and Holy Spirit is clearly pantheistic or panentheistic in nature. Though some of these teachers would claim to be believing in the God who is one God and three persons, by what they teach, they deny the very revealed character of God from Scripture. So what is pantheism? Well, the word pantheism is well known and is defined by Webster's Dictionary uh, this way. Pantheism, worship that admits or tolerates all gods. Two, the doctrine or belief that God is the universe and its phenomena, taken or conceived as a whole, or the doctrine that regards the universe as a manifestation of God. So, it tolerates all gods? <laughs> It's noteworthy to notice that there are similarities between the God being worshipped and promoted today in many Christian churches and this description of the pantheistic deity. On the subject of toleration of all gods, there are many ecumenical and interfaith overtures being made today in Christendom by a number of well-known leaders, basically telling people that we all worship the same God and that we just need to sort of add Jesus into that and recognize that he is the Messiah. YWAM has been doing this for uh, a long time among the Muslims. Here's a quote. Several international mission organizations, including Youth with a Mission, YWAM, are testing a new approach to missionary work in areas where Christianity is unwelcome. A March 24, 2000 Charisma News Service report said some missionaries are now making converts, but are allowing them to, them to hold on to many of their traditional religious beliefs and practices so as to refrain from offending others within their culture. The Charisma article noted, Messianic Muslims who continue to read the Quran, visit the mosque, and say their daily prayers, to Allah, of course, but accept Christ as their savior are the products of the strategy being tried in several countries. One particular church planner in Asia related how 50 members of a Muslim family accepted Christ as their savior and formed their own fellowship. He writes in YWAM's staff newsletter, they continued a life of following the Islamic requirements, including mosque attendance, fasting, and Quranic reading, besides getting together as a fellowship of Muslims who acknowledge Christ as a source of God's mercy for them. The Charisma Report added that YWAM is also adopting an, uh, the approach in India, where a team is working with a Hindu holy man. Mike Oppenheimer of Let Us Reason Ministries had an email exchange with one of these quote-unquote messianic Muslims. This messianic Muslim admitted that he did not believe that Jesus Christ was God. He was told to continue to follow the teachings of the Quran and his religion, but apparently was not told that in order to be saved, one must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to believe that God came in the flesh. Another example of toleration. Ted Haggard, who was the president of the National Association, 
of uh, evangelicals in league with the Institute on Religion and Democracy have been trying to get Christian leaders to agree to a platform where they're being more careful about what they say about Islam. This position paper condemned remarks disparaging Islam by some high-profile Christian leaders, including Franklin Graham. Yet in this paper, it's implied that we basically worship the same God. Christians just add Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and so are quote-unquote enriched rather than quote-unquote impoverished. Here's what it said, try to formulate and celebrate common acts of worship. As Christians who worship God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as instructed by our Lord Jesus, we find any worship that omits these names and concepts of God, offensive to Muslims, to be impoverished rather than enriched. We do not wish to strip our worship down to the point that Muslims would find it acceptable, nor do we require Muslims to reduce their worship to a point that would be acceptable to Christians. It's better to worship alongside Christians with them practicing what they consider to be a proper worship while we Christians absorb, ob observe the vice and vice versa rather than trying to have a common worship. Hmm. Of course, the, po the Pope claims Muslims worship the same YHWH and are actually saved because of it. In their writings by the Pope, uh, it says the plan of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the Creator in the first place amongst them wh whom are Muslims. These profess to hold the faith of Abraham, and together with us they adore the one merciful God, mankind's judge on the last day. And that's from the Catholic Catechism. I have a picture of the Pope kissing the, a copy of the Koran being given to him, basically doing homage to it. And you can find that uh, photo, photo and story at this uh, link. Robert Schuller, who's now departed, has been outspoken in his uh, interfaith push to justify religions like Islam. By the way, he also sold his crystal cathedral to the Catholics. Robert Schuller, whose crystal cathedral houses offices for Christians and Muslims for peace, told Imam Alfred Muhammad of the Muslim American Society that if he, Schuller, came back in a hundred years and found his des descendants were Muslims, it wouldn't bother him. Hmm, Schuller may get his wish sooner than that. Mother Teresa was a big proponent of toleration of religion. She said, I love all religions. If people become Muslims, better uh, Hindus, better Muslims, better Buddhists by our acts of love, then there's something else growing there. She upheld that there are many ways to God. She said, all is God. Buddhists, Hindus, Christians, etc. all have access to the same God. You know, I hate to bring this up, but even Billy Graham has made interfaith statements. In an interview with Robert Schuller, Graham said this, Well, Christianity uh, and, uh, and being a true believer, you know, I think there's the body of Christ. This comes from all the Christian groups around the world outside the, outside the Christian groups. I think everybody that loves Christ or knows Christ, whether they're conscious of it or not, they're members of the body of Christ. Hmm. And I don't think that we're going great, great sweeping revival that will turn the whole world to Christ at any time. I think James answered that, the Apostle James, in the first council in Jerusalem when he said that God's purpose for this age is to call out a people for his name. And that's what God's doing today. He's calling people out of the world for his name. Whether they come from the Muslim world or the Buddhist world or the Christian world or the non-believing world, they're members of the body of Christ because they've been called by God. They may not even know the name of Jesus, but they know in their hearts that they need something. And they, that they don't have, and they turn to the only light that they have. And I think they are saved, and that they're going to be with us in heaven. Can you believe it? On the Larry King live show on January 22, 1997, Graham made the similar statements. Larry King, what do you think of Mormonism, Catholicism, other faiths within the Christian concept? Billy Graham, well, I think I'm in a wonderful fellowship with all of them. Larry King, you're comfortable with Salt Lake City? You're comfortable, comfortable with the Vatican? Billy Graham, I'm very comfortable with the Vatican. Well, you know, I could go on and on. 
For more information on the toleration issue, you can read our ecumenism slash interface section. The above simply demonstrates toleration of all gods by men and organizations trying to claim Muslims, Hindus, and other religions worship the creator God of the Bible. And this is one mark of a pantheistic view of God. Another one is God is the universe. Pantheism also sees God as the universe itself. He's not the creator of the universe, he is the universe. Thus the universe is a manifestation of God. Everything is a manifestation of God because everything is God. This idea that God is the universe and all matter leads to one major error in all religions as well as in pantheistic Christianity today. That's the idea that if anything good happens, it must be God. And if anything bad happens, it's the devil battling against the nature of God. Of course, true pantheism would claim that the devil and evil are all part of God also. But with people who believe that God is good and God is everything, then it follows that the more they are infused with God or realize they are God, the more they will be protected from the dark side or the evil forces. But the Bible teaches that the Creator is separate from His creation and that God does allow bad things to happen to good people uh, quite a bit. For Christians, it's a way to test their faith. For unbelievers and false believers, it's a way to try to draw them to Himself. As we will discuss later, the way God is treated in many churches today is an evidence that they believe the manifestations they are seeing are God Himself. They try to wave more God into themselves, press him into people's foreheads, blow him at people, or try to breathe him in, attempt to birth him, etc. They talk about all kinds of anointings, not just in people, but in inanimate objects and even nations. An example, quote, God is doing something in the earth today. He is literally joining the anointing of nations. This nation has anointing uh, and this nation has anointing and that one, that's Dutch sheets of the national, uh, uh, the uh, New Apostolic Reformation. Another quote, I felt a terrific anointing. I was shaking all over, trembling under the power of God. Dear God, I said, I feel the anointing. I believe the anointing has lingered over Amy Semple McPherson's deceased body. That's Benny Hinn on 1991. Another quote, God can teach you the timing element. Lord, I ask right now for the anointing of timing to fall on all of us. That was Chuck Pierce and Cindy Jacobs. Another quote, I want you to get a spirit of prophecy on you that just keeps going. I call it the Energizer Bunny Anointing. That's also from the National School of the Prophets. That's John Eckhart. Another uh, quote, a tangible anointing filled the house as this man, Jim Gall, prepared our hearts to receive communion. It was an unforgettable experience, and that's also at the National School of the Prophets. And there were many people who spoke at that from the New Apostolic Reformation. You know, this is just a small sample from a few conferences hosted by the International Coalition of Apostles, Head Apostle C. Peter Wagner. And it illustrates a pantheistic uh, view of the Holy Spirit. First of all, there are no such anointings mentioned in the Bible. The anointing is shared by every Christian. Number two, there's no anointing on nations and dead bodies. Amazingly, Robert Schuller, Rick Warren, the Message Bible are all using the same language as Maitreya, the spirit being channeled by Benjamin Cream, who allegedly is going to be the Antichrist. Uh, but he's saying that he's, he's the coming uh, promised New Age Christ. They've all made pantheistic statements about God being in everyone. Quote, on page 88 in Messages from Maitreya the Christ, Maitreya is quoted as saying, My friends, God is nearer to you than you can imagine. God is yourself. God is within you and all around you. On page 88 of his book, The Reappearance of Christ and the Masters of Wisdom, Maitreya's spokesman, Benjamin Cream, um, explained Maitreya's new world religion. He described the same imminent aspect of God that Rick Warren was conveying with his new century translation of Ephesians 4, 6. 
Here's, here it is. But eventually a new world religion will be inaugurated, which will be uh, infusion and synthesis of the approach of the East and the approach of the West. The Christ will bring together not simply Christianity and Buddhism, but the concept of God transcendent outside of his creation and also the concept of God imminent in all creation, in man and all creation. This imminent aspect of God, which is so important to Maitreya's new world religion, new spirituality, is also taught as part of the Foundations course at Rick Warren's Saddleback Church. The Foundations Participant Guide reiterates Rick's, Rick Warren's teaching that God is in everything. The fact that God stands above and beyond his creation does not mean he stands outside of his creation. He's both transcendent above and beyond his creation and imminent within and throughout his creation. Now you have to realize that this use of the word imminent is not the same uh, use of the word that uh, pre-trib people use, but he's using it to mean that God is everything. Robert Schuller has also stressed this aspect of imminence. In a, a November 9, 2003 sermon at the Crystal Cathedral, Robert Schuller stated that God was not only transcendent but also imminent. He said that as a result of his being more aware of the imminence of God, his faith was now deeper, broader, and richer, more than ever. As previously cited, he summarized it what he meant by the imminence of God by telling his worldwide television audience, yes, God is alive and he's in every single human being. Another quote, also as previously mentioned in chapter 3 of his book, this imminent aspect of God is also evident in Rick Warren's favorite uh, paraphrase, Eugene Peterson's The Message. The notion that God is in everything and is one with creation is contained in the magical saying, as above, so below. You know, this is a, the mystical New Age phrase that Eugene Peterson injected in its entirety into the Lord's Prayer and in its derivative form into Colossians 1.16, the verse that Rick Warren uses to introduce his readers to the purpose-driven purpose life. As previously cited, the editors of the New Age Journal describe this imminent aspect of God and its New Age significant in their book as above, so below. As above, so below. As below, so above. This maxim implies that the transcendent God beyond the physical universe and the imminent God within ourselves are one. Another quote. The spiritual imp implications of all of these overlapping statements are enormous. Rick Warren, Robert Schuller, and Eugene Peterson are all now teaching this imminent aspect of God, that God is in everyone. On this critical theological point, these particular uh, Christian leaders are not only not exposing one of the central uh, uh, concepts of the new spirituality and probable new world religion, they seem to be agreeing with it. Benny Hinn has also allowed this same type of language to characterize all Indians by saying we're all children of one God in his recent crusade uh, <clears throat> and on his TV show. And this is not, was not corrected by him or anyone else. These pantheistic statements by Warren, Schuller, and others are pure heresy. They deny the true character of God and the one way by which men may become children of God as taught in the Bible. Now there's one issue we must deal with at this juncture, and it's part of the uh, definition of, of, uh, of this issue, and that is the universe as a manifestation of God. You know, it is the issue of the uh, uh, glory of God. The difference between the glory of God appearing in the Old Testament in the tabernacle, in the temple on Mount Zion and to many prophets, and is uh, and this new pantheistic anointing is clear. When the glory was present, the person of God was also present. Rick Joyner states, angelic appearances will be common to the saints and a visible glory of God will appear upon some for extended periods of time as power flows through them. The Bible is clear that there are Two or th where two or three are gathered together in Jesus' name, He, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, will be there in the midst of them. The person of Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the Father. 
That leaves the Holy Spirit to indwell believers. The Bible says that the person of the Holy Spirit today <clears throat> indwells both the body of Christ corporately and the individual Christian. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Jesus Christ himself as a chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. 1 Corinthians 6.19 Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. Ephesians 1.13 And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the triune God. When the person of the Holy Spirit is being waved into people, pressed into foreheads, said to indwell dead bodies, that's not the person of the Holy Spirit they're demonstrating or worshiping, but a panentheistic or pantheistic deity. Very likely this pantheistic spirit is evil spirits or the spirit of Antichrist, 1 John 4, 3, because it's clearly not the spirit of truth, John 14, 17. Nor do its followers tell the truth, for false doctrine, false prophecies, and all manner of other lies are always present at their meetings. This tangible anointing, quote-unquote, being felt by people is a ruse of Satan, or the delusion of imaginations, but either way, it's clearly not the Holy Spirit. God's not present where truth is disdained. Consider some facts about the true work of the Holy Spirit and compare them to what we see in many churches today. The Holy Spirit's work is not to entertain by shows of manifestation. He's here primarily to bring the individual Christian to sanctification, ethically and biblically. His work is to make us more like Christ, John 17, 19, by focusing our full attention on Christ, Ephesians 4, 15. He is here to empower the Christian to serve God, edify the church, and reach the lost. The second point is the Holy Spirit does not need a humanistically, emotionally charged atmosphere in which to work. But the spirit of the kingdom of the air feeds on emotionalism and sensuality. And here's the verses. Number three, the Holy Spirit needs hearts and minds submitted in obedience to the word of God and the will of the Father. The pantheistic spirit wants hearts and minds committed to the pursuit of power, wealth, health, and following after men with special anointings. Signs and wonders may indeed follow those who are born again and regenerated by the Holy Spirit. But signs and wonders never lead, uh, never lead in true biblical Christianity, but they do in pantheistic meetings. The Holy Spirit promotes a better understanding of who God is. The pantheistic spirit promotes pagan and Gnostic understanding. In the third wave, you are seeing people worshiping a pantheist of God in the name of Christianity, no matter if they call him Jesus Christ or Holy Spirit. You're not seeing the true work of the person of the Holy Spirit. You're seeing new age in the churches. Well, let's move on to the concept of panentheism as opposed to pantheism. Panentheism is a derivative of pantheism and is defined this way. This universal arrangement is not pantheism, all is God, but pan panentheism, a term devised by Carl F. Krauss, to describe his thought. It's best known for its use by Charles uh, Hartshorn and recently by Matthew Fox. Panentheism says that all is in God, somewhat as if God were the ocean and we are the fish. If one considers what is in God's body to be part of God, then we can see that God is all there, there is, and then some. The universe is God's body, but God's awareness or personality is greater than the sum of all the parts of the universe. All the parts have some degree of freedom in co-creating with God. At the start of its moment, momentary career as a subject, an experience is God as the divine initial aim. As the experience carries on its 
choosing process, it's a freely, it is a freely aiming reality that's not strictly God since it departs from God's purpose to some degree. Yet everything is within God. Not a lot of difference, I'm afraid. Well, let's look at the proponents of this idea, Matthew Fox. First of all, notice the mention of Matthew Fox, a defrocked Catholic priest, now involved with the Episcopal Church. Fox has been uh, in, influential in a number of Protestant Christian leaders who quote from, from him and have been in conferences with him. Yet he's clearly a New Age panentheist. Matthew Fox says, Indeed, the birthing of the cosmic Christ is the perfect purpose of the Incarnation. Divinity wants to birth the cosmic Christ in each and every individual. The coming together of the historical Jesus and the cosmic Christ will make Christianity whole at last. Christianity has been out of touch with its core, its center. Perhaps a new ecumenical council will be forthcoming in our lifetime. This one would be deeply ecumenical and would call forth the wisdom of all the world's religions. What is needed if there is to be a, tw uh, a 21st century for Mother Earth and her children is a spiritual vision that prays, celebrates, and lives out the reality of the cosmic Christ who lives and breathes in Jesus and in all God's children, in all the prophets of religion everywhere, and in all creatures of the universe. The cosmic Christ, quote-unquote, is a straight New Age concept, having nothing to do with the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ. This idea of birthing Christ has now infiltrated Christianity and is being promoted by the New Apostolic Reformation. Quote, I believe the prophetic anointing is so powerful because I believe that it takes us five and ten years to get into that when you get around the prophetic anointing, you can be birthed into that realm in a short period of time. And I believe the way you raise up leaders very quickly and the way you accelerate people of God is not to have them go ten years to Bible school and ten more years in discipleship and then, you know, five more years in inter internship. I believe the way we can raise up, raise up people very quickly is to get them around some apostles and some prophets who can raise them up very quickly and get them to healing the sick and raising the dead and casting out devils and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. One of the strategies that God is giving us, <clears throat> we go around the world, is to touch an emerging generation of young apostles and young prophets and to expose them to the prophetic because when we prophesy over them, something comes over them and they are birthed into the uh, position and they begin to uh, move in that particular position. And I believe it's an end time strategy of raising up an entire generation of apostles and prophets. And that was John Eckhart. Quote, there are three speakers during this week that can be credited with bringing the presence back into the Brownsville Sanctuary. John and Carol Arnott came from Ar Toronto. These two are famous for the so-called Toronto Blessing, of which we do, do not hear much any, uh, very much anymore. Cindy Jacobs also came and ministered that week. Jacobs is billed on their website as a prophetess to the nations. She ministers widely in river apostolic churches. See Peter Wagner's on her board and Dutch Sheets is her pastor. She's been awarded an honorary doctorate by Bishop Bill Hammond. He, she sees prophetic intercession as commissioned by God to pull down spiritual strongholds in the heavenlies which impede evangelism. Her ministry is called Generals of Intercession and in the time of war it is the generals who make battle plans. By the way, you can partner with her by entering a Shumanite covenant for as little as $25 a month. She, as well as others in the prophetic warfare movement, have picked up the latter rain teaching of the birthing of the man-child based on Revelations 12, 5 through 6. This teaching asserts that an end-time church of overcomers will birth the man-child. This man-child is said to be a worldwide revival. In her most recent uh, issue of Generals of Intercession News, the feature article is, Revival is in the Birth Canal. In the same issue, she asserts that Christians have pushed and pushed, and it was like a postpartum depression. She prophesied, But the Lord would say to you, Surely the baby has been born. 
Obviously, she, she seems confused as to whether the baby has been born or it's still in the birth canal. The concept of a panentheistic force was promoted by Kenneth Copeland, John Wimber, and the uh, Vineyard uh, Movement, Toronto Blessing, and others. Uh, Kenneth Copeland is famous for saying, faith is a force, like Star Wars. As you can see from Wimber's statements, he says that God and his gifts are a force. This is a completely new age occultic concept and the idea of moving in other dimensions is something commonly heard from those who have had a close encounter of the third kind or those in contact with people like Barbara Marks Hubbard, Elizabeth Kerr Prophet, Matthew Fox, Robert Mueller, and uh, Pierre Teilhard de, de Chardin. Matthew Fox has been behind a lot of the current panentheism we see in the churches today. Here's a smattering of his teachings. Matthew Fox is a former Roman Catholic known for his creation spirituality. While he was being examined for his radical ideas, he received an invitation to become an Episcopal priest. Fox accepted and now teaches a celebration of the spirit of pantheism, the, the world is divine, uh, during his mo uh, monthly techno mass in o Oakland, uh, California. Indeed, the Episcopal Episcopal Church stands for change, and Spong and Fox's leaven has affected them first. Many of the women ordained as priests in the Episcopal Church pray to Sophia, uh, rejecting the biblical language for Father, for the Father, for, for God the Creator. The mystical discoveries of Matthew Fox, a Dominican priest from the Institute of Culture, in culture and creation spirituality suggests that we abandon any further quest for the historical Jesus and refocus our attention on a quest for the cosmic Christ. The most important definition of the cosmic Christ is the pattern that connects. Christ is just a pre-runner for us all as we follow that path. Matthew Fox, a New Age spiritual, uh, spiritualist, said very similar statements. Divinity is not outside us. We are in God and God is in us. The cos and that's from the cosmic Christ. We are all called like the cosmic Christ to radiate the divine presence to, with, from one another. Christ in the universe and cosmic Christ in other religion, yet the religions, yet the divine one is present in them all. Dominican priest and founder of the Institute of uh, Culture and Creation, Matthew Fox, noted, I think, frankly, that the survival of the Earth today depends on an Earth consciousness, that we move beyond nationalism, for example, in a sense of bioregionalism, that we move beyond dualism of, of first world, th third world, uh, north, south, communist, socialist, capitalist. It's all, um, it's over with. I think the only future the planet has is a spiritual awakening that's, awakening that's global, global but local. And that's why I think the Earth's religions are coming forth at this time in history. Mm. Matthew Fox visited Sydney in January 1993. The New Age meeting attracted hundreds of church people and was closed by a uniting church minister who praised Fox in glowing terms. Matthew Fox, apostate Catholic priest, director of the Institute in Culture and Creation Spirituality in California, one of the top leaders in this new world takeover, has much to say about the relation between Mother Earth and native religion. Strong associations with the uniting uh, Anglican and Catholic churches. Fox writes of the New Age, New World Order beliefs about Mother Earth and the religions uh, of the tribal peoples in his book, The Coming of the Cosmic Christ. Um, Fox believes the Earth is dying partly because of the tribal religions are dying. Mankind has a an urgent task, according to Fox. That task is to strengthen and support the tribal religions. He writes, Mother Earth is dying. The first meaning of the warning, your mother is dying, can be taken in reference to Mother Earth. That the Earth is our mother is a deeply held truth among native peoples of, of Americas, Africa, Asia, and Europe. Among Europeans, the teachings of the great Benedictine abbess of the uh, 12th century, Hildegard of Bingen, 
stand out. The earth is at the same time mother. She is mother of all that is natural, mother of all that is human. She is the mother of all, for contained in her are the seeds of all. The oldest religion uh, on our planet are not the great world religions of Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, but the religion of the native peoples of the Americas, Africa, ancient Europe, uh, Australia, Polynesia, and Asia. In these religions, one finds deep memories of what essayist Frederick Turner uh, calls Aboriginal mother love. These uh, religions arose in cultural periods that were uh, matrifocal. They referenced Mother Earth and her fruitfulness. They were non-dualistic in their uh, celebration of the sacred hoop that binds all cre uh, creatures and gifts of the earth together. The rock people, the cloud people, the tree people, the finned ones, the winged ones, the two-legged ones. By following the cycles of seasons and harmonizing with the wisdom of Mother Earth, they shared in the family of creation. Aboriginal mother love was imperiled by Europeans schooled in hatred of creation and the sick and the sacralization of dualism. The great mother archetypes of native peoples everywhere have been practically exterminated by patriarchal holocausts and colonialism. There is spider woman and white buffalo woman in the Americas. There's Gaia and Athena in Europe. There's ocean and y Yamaya among others. In Africa there's Sophia in Greece and Shekinah in Israel. Shekinah. Aboriginal mother love is in us the mother principle. Without spider woman, <laughs> no creation would ever take place. The goddess in everyone has been dying along with creation, mother earth and wisdom. So said my dream. Wow, what a dream this guy had, huh? Of course, he didn't include Semiramis and uh, Asherah <laughs> of the ancient world. Hmm. This ethic is at the heart of what is driving the world gathering on indigenous people and First Nations movement. Others have been in conferences featuring Fox. Robert Schuller is among them. In October 1987, Schuller spoke at the Roman Catholic Conference called the Jesus Day No. 7 in Chicago. Catholic priests Matthew Fox, John Powell, and Richard McBrien also spoke. M. Scott Peck. Uh, endorsed Fox's book. He said in 1988, M. M. Scott Peck endorsed a Cosmic New Age Christ book by Math Matthew Fox, a mystical New Age Catholic priest. Yet, Evangelical David Maines has extensively approvingly quoted from Peck's writings on his radio program. And the GARBC approved Grand Rapids College has um, uh, carried an article in its paper by Bill Hybels, which favorably quoted Peck. They all quote each other. This is all to show that Matthew Fox and his panentheistic ideas have had an effect on many Christian leaders and movements, and now we're beginning to see the effects of this special brand of New Age in the church. All is God. Panentheism tries to make God a little bigger than the God of pantheism. The God of pantheism is everything. The God of panentheism is bigger than the sum of his parts, and the universe is only part of his manifestation. But you know, really, these concepts are very much the same. In both, God is the universe. The First Nations movement, as well as YWAM, are both promoting the agenda of the New Apostolic, are busy preaching the message that the First Nations cultures were created by God and already had a way to make things right with God even before they heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. According to them, all they have to do is reassert their God-created cultures and get back to where they started. Quote, so these are the clues that we felt God had left the Hawaiian people and evidence that he's left as well as processes he's left in which are Hawaiian people can respond in a very natural way to God and really set things right between uh, them and God. Another quote, there's a myth that we have labored 
under for centuries in indigenous communities, and that myth is that we are a godless heathen people. That's Terry LeBlanc, uh, LeBlanc who is with World Vision Canada. Quote, appreciating one's culture is appreciating the creation of God in a unique and beautiful manner. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we are also called to redeem our culture as we grow in God. And that's from a YWAM DTS. You know, this is the same idea that has been circulated, circulating among ecumenical World Council of Church groups for years. Quote, the sovereign God created cultures within the expanse of his grace and subservient to his redemptive plan. He chose cultures as the arena in which the gospel of the kingdom transpired, uh, was transmitted, responded to, and applied. Thus, churches have to be more intentional in building up their capacity to reach others for Christ and enfold them into a community that values the meaningful cultural expression of their faith. And that's from a World Council of Churches. This idea, now used by First Nations adherents, is that God already had a plan of salvation before Jesus Christ was even known among the Hawaiians, for instance. Quote, and yet all brings glory to God in its own way. And that's true of human beings and cultures as well. God is now calling forth from among the indigenous communities of the world that good deposit which he made in them of their cultures, their languages, their musical expressions, and all that sort of thing, as an expression of praise and worship unto himself. You know, this God he is describing is part of their cultures, languages, and, and, and music, and all human beings and cultures bringing glory to God in their own way. But I have to ask, did Hitler's Germany bring glory to God? Did Saddam Hussein's Iraq bring glory, bring glory to God? Does American culture bring glory to God? Did Israel bring glory to God by worshiping in the high places? You know what? The stark reality is that no earthly culture is created by God, nor does any culture bring glory to God, especially Gentile cultures. Of course, God set up his law for, the, for Israel. Unfortunately, Israel did not follow it. Cultures are the traditions of men, which the Bible states are in opposition to God. We are even warned not to be taken in by those who hold up culture above the word. Colossians 2.8 See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition um, and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. The following sounds like a panentheistic God to me. Quote, it's about exploring, expressing, and celebrating the presence of God among the peoples and the fulfillment of that presence in the person and work and life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're doing. That's Terry LeBlanc again. You know what? That's clearly panentheism. God was and is not present among uh, pagan societies. He's always been evident in his creation, but this sounds like God's blessing was resting on pagan societies, or it sounds like pantheism or a mix of both. God is said to have been present in all cultures in Jesus Christ in the personification of that presence. But the Bible teaches that God is not his universe. He stands separate and distinct from his creation, outside of his creation. Isaiah 40, 22 says, He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and the people and his people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. Acts 17, 24, the God who made the world and everything in it is the God of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. John 8, 23, and he was saying to them, you are from below, I am from above, you are of this world, I am not of this world. God is contrasted with the world. God created the world and these are the verses. This is because he dwells in the supernatural, in eternity. God is self-existent. He's unchangeable. He's eternal. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient. He's incomprehensible. The reason he can be omnipresent without being everything is because he's in eternity, while his creation is in time. 
Psalms 93, 2, your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. Proverbs 8, 23, I was appointed from eternity from the beginning before the world began. God is in the supernatural while the rest of creation is in the natural. Time and matter don't affect God. He's present everywhere at all times, but he's not his creation. He holds together the fabric of the universe, but he's not that universe. The fatal mistake of both pantheism and panentheism is a misunderstanding of who God is. Panentheism has failed to understand the true uniqueness of God, and people who call themselves Christians who have this view of God do not know God. He's far greater than his creation. The, the Bible says that the great white throne judgment, heaven and earth, will flee from his presence. Ooh, Revelation 20, 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence and there was no place for them. You know, when God really shows up, quote unquote, as new apostolic people are fond of saying in their meetings, uh, which is obviously not happening, the whole fabric of the universe comes apart as, at his appearing. The heavens and earth will pass away and he will create an entirely new universe from nothing like he did the first time, ex nihilo, 2 Peter 3.13. But in keeping with his promise, we're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. Revelations 21.1, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Only those who have put their trust in Jesus Christ to save them by his blood shed on the cross in their place will go to eternal life uh, beyond the day the universe as we know it is dissolved. There's no one who can be a child of God without coming through the Son. None of the earth's religions do anyone any good eternally. There may be some good traditions in them, but these traditions do not save or even make a person good. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. This earth is going to pass away, and those who do not know the Son will not have life, nor do they have abundant life now. John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What about, what about the idea of co-creating with God? Take note in the definition of panentheism, everyone and everything are said to be of God's body and that all the parts have some degree of freedom in co-creating with God. That is, again, a New Age concept that you'll find in many New Age and occult books and other source materials. <clears throat> Quote, I may, according to the RCH, be 100% responsible for creating my own reality, including my current body, but we're all co-responsible for co-creating the entire physical earth plane as we find it. Oh, wow. I didn't know we were that important. Quote, such wizards must repeat these lessons until they have concluded that the path to evolution stems from conscious co-creation using the divine will aspect. By the way, that's from a wizard book. Quote, the era of single savior is over. What is needed now is joint action, combined effort, collective co-creation. That's Neil Donald Walsh, another New Ager. I mean, there's a major shift in the relation between humans and God from the passive a creature child to the active participant in the process of creation. We are the co and the creator. We are the co and the creator is the creator. We are the first generation to be conscious of evolution and responsible for guiding our evolution on a planetary scale. That's a straight ahead uh, new ager called Barbara Marx Hubbard. This is also basically what Word of Faith and New Apostolic uh, Leadership teaches. You have the same creative faith and ability on the inside of you that God used when he created the heavens and the earth. That's Kenneth Copeland. The force of faith is released by words. That's Kenneth Copeland again. You create the presence of Jesus, Jesus with your mouth. He is bound by your lips and by your words. 
Remember that Christ is depending upon you and your spoken word to release his present. Oh my goodness. That's Paul Yonggi Cho. Words create pictures and pictures in your mind create words and then the words come out your mouth. And when that spiritual force comes out, it's going to give substance to the image that's on, uh, on the inside of you. Oh, that's visual, visualization stuff. Oh, that's new age. No, new age is trying to do this and they'd get somewhat results out of it because this is a spiritual law, brother. <laughs> that's Kenneth Copeland likening uh, his idea to new age. We're going to declare. We're going to decree. This is what the prophets do. God has called us here tonight to change things in the heavenlies. That's Cindy Jacobs of the New Apostolic Reformation. Cho's concept of fourth dimensional thinking is nothing short of occultism. In his best-selling book, The Fourth Dimension, Cho unveils his departure from historic Christian theology and his entry into the world of the occult. Cho lists four steps in his incubation uh, formula. Number one, visualize a clear-cut goal and idea in your mind. Number two, have a burning desire for your objective. Number three, pray until you get the guarantee or assurance from God that what you desire is already yours. And number four, speak or confess the end result into existence. That's Paul Yonggi Cho again. We find many leaders in Christendom today stating that they can create reality with their words, just like God can. This comes from a panentheistic view of God, from new thought, latter rain, and word of face. This erroneous, er, erroneous um, view of the nature of God is now cut, touching practically every church in every part of the globe. You can go to your local church and most likely you'll see and hear evidences of pantheism and panentheism in the music, materials, uh, manifestations, worship, and messages. Here's a popular Christian song you've probably heard and sung. It's called Breathe by Mary Barnett. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your Holy Spirit presence living in me. This is my daily bread. This is my daily bread. Your very word spoken to me. And I'm desperate for you. I'm, I'm lost without you. This is the air that I breathe. This is the air that I breathe. Your Holy Spirit living in me. Uh, Holy presence living in me. This is my daily bread. This is my daily bread. Your very word spoken to me. And I'm desperate for you, I'm desperate for you, I'm lost without you, I'm lost without you, I'm lost without you. This is the air that I breathe, this is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me, I'm lost without you, etc., etc. This is panthe panentheism. Conclusion. What we're seeing today in the counterfeit revivals and apostolic movements is an evidence of panentheistic God who's different from the revealed God of Scripture. Anytime you see people claiming they can impart and manipulate God, the Holy Spirit, you're seeing a denial of the core doctrine of the Trinity. Who God is. God is one what and three who's, with each who possessing all the attributes of deity and personality. One God eternally existing in three persons. When you see people teaching you can co-create with God because you're a little God, uh, which is a confession doctrine, they're in denial of the deity of God because we make him subject to the will of men. When you see the Holy Spirit being thrown around rooms and pressed into people's foreheads, you're seeing a denial of the person of God. The Holy Spirit is not a force or an it. He is a he, the great I am. He exists apart from his creation. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit has to do with the supernatural in the spirit of man, not the material realm of the body and soul through those who can be sanctified through the obedience to the word through the spirit. Panentheist, panentheistic third wave meetings are solical, fleshly. They do not understand who God is, therefore they're not experiencing God, but rather they are at the mercy of their imaginations, their emotions, and sometimes even the demonic and paranormal realm. It's startling that the New Age has so thoroughly leavened the church, but then this was predicted by some long ago. Quote, the movie Star Wars popularized the concept of a force that permeated the universe with its dark and light sides and can be tapped into and used for good and evil. This modern concept of God has generally replaced all past ideas of God or gods. 
George Lucas, creator of Star Wars, is only one of millions of people who believe in this force, including many of today's leading scientists. Uh, and uh, his film series is an evangelistic tool for converting the world to his belief. This is the basic Hindu occult philosophy, and it lies at the heart of the New Age movement. And that's Dave Hunt. Dave Hunt wore this long ago. The New Age was coming into the church, and people did not believe him at the time of, of, of the book that he wrote called uh, The Seduction of Christianity. We need to listen now because all that stuff is in many churches. Mm -hmm. 